Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Latvi Maribet, and I am an optometrist and neuroscientist working at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear and Harvard Medical School. And my interest is working with neuroplasticity in individuals with blindness, both of ocular as well as brain-based causes. I'm going to start my lecture with a particularly broad statement here, and it says the number one individual cause of pediatric blindness and visual impairment is not due to disease of the eye, but rather damage to the brain. And I think that's a very important statement because what that means is that being born blind today or visually impaired today and moving forward is going to look very, very different than how it looked, say, 20, 30 years ago. And I think this has an important impact in terms of how we assess, diagnose, and ultimately rehabilitate individuals who are born with visual impairment. So let me just unpack this, this issue for you a little bit more. When we think about blindness and visual impairment, we have to think about the timing as well as the location or cause of the visual impairment itself. So typically we can think of individuals who are born with an ocular disease or ocular uh, issue, something like retinopathy of prematurity is a, is a very, very common example. There are also individuals, as you know, who are born with normal vision and then later in life develop some sort of visual impairment due to an ocular disease or impairment. Uh, macular degeneration is a typical example as well. You also are aware that there are individuals who are born, again, with normal visual vision, a visual function, I should say, but later in life develop a visual impairment or blindness, not because of disease of the eye, but rather damage to the visual brain. And this is also very, very common in cases of, say, stroke or traumatic brain injury. But there is a fourth population or fourth scenario where individuals are born blind or visually impaired due to damage or some sort of perinatal accident that occurs during pregnancy or shortly thereafter. And this is the group that I would like to concentrate on today, and I'll give you more background about this information, or, or some more information, I should say, about this population. The second thing I'd like to mention is that this is an evolving public health concern. In other words, this is not a project that we looked for. This was a project that came to us. And I'll give you a little bit more details about that in the background. This is the Perkins School for the Blind. This, as you, some of you may know, this is the first and oldest school for the blind in the country with a very, very long history of, uh, of educating individuals with blindness. Helen, Helen Keller, for example, was a student here. If you looked at the classic Perkins uh, uh, child who was enrolled uh, at the school, say, 30, 40, maybe 50 years ago, that child typically was blind or visually impaired due to some sort of underlying ocular disease or impairment. A rubella infection, for example, was very, very common. Now we also see also cases of things like retinopathy of prematurity. But what we noticed over the past 20 years or so is that the profile of the typical child at Perkins has changed. And now we're seeing more and more children who are blind or visually impaired, not because of ocular-based problems, but because of problems related to brain impairment or brain damage. And this is extremely important because what teachers were reporting to us is that classic uh, curriculum and skills that they would learn in the case of ocular-based uh, impairment are not applying in the case of these children who have brain-based impairment. And if you were to look across the country, the actual breakdown of children who are enrolled in schools for the blind, this was a study that was done over three uh, over 3,000 children, you will find that what's called cortical visual impairment or cerebral visual impairment is the most common diagnosis found in schools for the blind across the country right now. It is also now the number one cause of pediatric blindness and visual impairment in the developed world and developed countries. And the reason why we think this is the case is because in these countries, we're getting very, very good at taking care of children who are born with prenatal or should, I should say perinatal complications or accidents. These children weren't surviving 30, 40 years ago, but again, with excellent neonatal care today, these children are surviving and they're surviving with complications and we, we need to find a way to take care of them and educate and rehabilitate them as well. A little bit more information about this particular condition called CVI or cerebral cortical visual impairment. Typically, we say this is a child that has a normal uh, eye examination. Well, this is not typically true. That you know, children do may have certain eye uh, conditions, but the functional definition is absolutely crucial, and that this is a visual impairment due to the maldevelopment of central visual pathways that cannot be explained otherwise by ocular pathology or refractive findings alone. And this is extremely important because very often we hear stories of families telling us that they go and see their eye doctor, they look at the eye, they run some various tests, they don't see any particular problem, and they can't explain why the child has all these visual difficulties. And again, the issue is based on a problem at the level of the brain, not necessarily at the level of the eye. Visual acuity can range from normal to profound blindness, and visual deficits are also present, or typically present, and this is typically in the lower visual field. 
Uh, there is, or the key issue uh, in this particular case is there's a medical history that's consistent with, again, some sort of perinatal neurological impairment or injury. This could be, for example, related to cerebral palsy or epilepsy. And there's also characteristic neuroradiological findings as well, typically. Things like periventricular leukomalacia or PDL, neonatal encephalopathy or white matter injury. Then also something that is extremely interesting in this particular population is that there is the presence of these unique higher order visual processing deficits, what we refer to as visual, spatial, and complex motion processing deficits, as well as difficulty sustaining attention. And on the net, we call this, or we refer to this as dorsal stream dysfunction. So to give you some examples, typically children will tell us that they have a very, very hard time walking through uh, a, a busy environment, say the airport or the shopping mall, or difficulty going down a flight of stairs. A young child might tell us, for example, that, you know, this is my favorite toy, but if you place it in a toy box, they have no idea where the toy is. They can't find it anymore. Or an older adolescent might tell us that we have really a hard time uh, finding their classroom or particular friends that they may know in a crowd. So again, this constellation of these higher order visual processing issues tells us that this is not a problem at the level of the eye. This is really a processing level at the, at the, at the level of the brain. So how do we assess these children? How do we understand or get a, a good handle the, of their visual deficits. Well, it's important to distinguish two things, what are referred to as visual function and functional vision, which obviously sound very similar, but are two very, very different concepts. Visual function is what we do typically uh, in a standard eye exam. So this describes how the eyes and the basic visual system perform with regards to specific aspects of vision. So things like visual acuity, contrast testing, visual field tests, these are all examples of visual function. The problem is, is that these are not what we would call ecologically valid, right? The world is not filled with just letters and simple contrast and dots uh, on, on a screen. The opposite, the other side of the coin, if you will, on that is what's referred to as functional vision. And this describes how well an individual performs while interacting with the visual environment and activities of daily living. So this could be, for example, grocery shopping, uh, in a classroom, or driving. These are real, are real world scenarios. The problem with functional vision is that it's very difficult to objectively measure because there are so many variables that are going on in each specific setting. What we do know is typically that visual function and functional vision go hand in hand. That's to say when a person has good visual function, they typically have good functional vision. But what we're starting to realize more and more, particularly in the case of brain-based visual impairment, is that that relationship is less and less clear. So we need new ways to assess visual function and particular functional vision. And let me explain why, uh, sort of give you a real world example of how, how that uh, comes about. If you work with children with CVI like I do, typically you're going to hear things like looking at dots and stars and letters are boring, right? So our typical tests of like visual acuity and even things that we can develop in the lab, these classic psychophysical stimuli, are not terribly interesting for children, right? So we have very, very good stimulus control. We know exactly what the stimuli are and what they represent, but they have very, very poor meaning in terms of the real world, so poor ecological validity. If you're a child, this is what your world looks like, right? You're more interested in, try, for example, trying to find your favorite toy in a toy box. That's what the real world looks like. The problem is, as I mentioned, while this is ecologically valid, it has poor stimulus control, right? There are many variables in there that, that make it difficult to understand why the child might be having difficulty finding that favorite toy, for example. What I propose to you is that there's a middle ground, and that middle ground is virtual reality, particularly creating simulations that at the same time have good stimulus control and at the same time maintain ecological validity. And that's exactly what we are pursuing in this particular study. So before we started, we created a focus group we brought in teachers, the visually impaired clinicians, as well as parents of children with CVI to identify areas of concern. And the two that came out that were really the most predominant were identifying a toy in a toy box, for example, as well in our older population, identifying a familiar individual in a crowd. So from there, we created two virtual reality-based environments. One that we call the virtual toy box, and the second what we refer to as the virtual hallway. And I'll show you some testing, some behavioral testing we've done with these two paradigms. So here's the virtual toy box. The individual sits in front of a large screen like this, and it's a sort of a first-person perspective. You're looking, for example, from a, into, into a toy box like this that has all sorts of toys placed in it. And on the bottom of the screen here is a Toby eye tracker that tracks the movement of the eyes as the individual is looking at the screen. The task starts by the individual has to choose a toy. It could be a blue truck, a yellow duck here, or an orange basketball. And then that toy is placed in a 5 by 5 
five matrix of other toys as well. So here's the blue truck, and what we call this low distractor level, where there's only one to three different toys around the area, and then we increase the difficulty of the task. So on the medium level of difficulty, there are four to six distractor elements around, and on the high uh, task difficulty, there are seven to nine different toys that could be surrounding in the box as well. So from low, medium to high, and this represents our task difficulty increase. We also have something called a color match scenario, where there's a second toy that's the same color but obviously a different shape and we want to see whether or not the child uses a color cue in order to try to find uh, the target or do they actually know what the target that they're actually looking for and then finally we have something called the background scenario where we actually overload if you will the visual scene by creating maximal complexity maximal um, confusion if you will to see if that also uh, taxes uh, the individual's visual system so let's look at a head-to-head -head comparison of a control individual here who's matched by age with a CVI individual on the right. This is a head-to-head -head comparison. What you see is this yellow blob will represent where the eyes are looking at a particular time. And this, and this task, the individual is meant to look and search for the blue uh, truck. So here we go. If you compare the control with the CVI, you'll find that the CVI individual goes straight to the actual toy without any problem, whereas the CVI individual searches a lot more before they actually find the blue truck. Here's the color match scenario. Do you see how the CVI individual goes back and forth before they actually find the blue truck? Here is the high clutter situation. In this particular case, the CVI subject was able to find it. And in this particular example, CVI subject missed it completely. So this gives you an idea about visual search. It's not just about knowing where to look but it's also about knowing where not to look and to not be distracted by the, the other elements in the visual scene. So you may say, well, there may be the problem behind here, or the reason that uh, this individual with CVI has problem finding the, uh, the target is that underlying ocular motor issue. Well, that's actually not the case. Here is the same individual who is simply asked to look for the blue truck on its own, and what you notice is the saccades are very crisp and brisk right to the target. So when the target is by itself, they have no problem finding it. So again, suggesting that this is a processing problem, it's not necessarily an acuity issue, it's really about how the individual is able to interact with the visual scene. So putting some data to this, we've compared individuals with neurotypical development, individuals with ocular-based visual impairment, this individual happens to have ocular albinism, and individuals with CVI. So on the low distractor task, this is called a heat map. So what we do is we center the data so we can compare trial and trial uh, with one another. And you see this tight sort of fitting ring around the target. That, is, that tight cluster represents a very, very focused and, and, and precise eye movement straight to the target. So here in our control and the low distractor task, you can see that the eye movements are very, very tight around the target. On the high distractor task, again, they have no problem finding the target, very, very tight uh, distribution of gaze. In the ocular visual impairment individual, on the low distractor task, we see a much broader uh, search area in order to find the target. And in the high distractor case, we notice that that target area is also, or I should say that search area is also very large as well. If we now look at the individual with CVI, what we find in the low distractor level is that and there's almost an intermediate level of gaze dispersion on the low distractor level. And on the high distractor level, we see a much larger increase of gaze dispersion. So what we see is that there's this relationship with gaze dispersion or gaze search as a function of task demand. And we can quantify this. Here, I'm quantifying the confidence lips area. In other words, how large this gaze area is as a function of distractor level. So low, medium, and high. In our controls, we have essentially a flat relationship, a slight uptick between between medium and high. So in other words, as task demand increases, the gaze performance is essentially the same. In our control individuals, we see exactly the same profile, but just shifted up. In other words, the same sort of performance across task difficulty. And in our CVI participants, we see that low distractor level, it starts off somewhat at, a, at an intermediate level. And as task demand increases, we see this upshift, this, um, this, this slope, this increasing slope, or our high sensitivity, I should say, to task demand. The other thing you might ask yourself, was this somehow related to a processing problem, or is this related to the fact that they have, may have impaired visual acuity? Well, we have a subset of individuals with CVI who have very good visual acuity, 20, 20, or 25. And what we find is when we test these individuals, the profile is exactly the same. Again, indicating that this is not necessarily an acuity problem. This is really a central processing deficit that, uh, that associates this in, impaired uh, visual search with increasing visual demand.
We are playing with uh, other scenarios using this in a way that could be per, uh, perhaps useful as an assessment tool. So for example, if the child is having a hard time finding the target, we could look at different cues that might be useful for that. So moving the target, for example, or changing the color of the target might be useful as well, or changing the luminance of the target. So we're now moving to a situation of not using virtual reality just for assessment, but also for the possibility of probing cues that might be useful for that child. And I'll give you another example of that in a, in a few minutes. Moving now to our second scenario, which we call the virtual hallway, and this is particularly in uh, kids with CVI who are more in, a, in adolescent uh, ages in their teens. Uh, very, very similar approach, except in this scenario here, instead of looking at a toy box, the individual is looking inside a corridor of a fictitious high school with people who are moving around. Here the individual chooses uh, their principal, this is their target from, uh, from gender and, uh, and race uh, balanced uh, choices. Once they pick their principal that they want to look for, we have three scenarios that we show them. The low condition is the target surrounded by one or one to five uh, individuals uh, around the hallway. Medium is uh, a, a six to ten people in the hallway and the, the high demand task is having as, as many as 11 to 15 people moving in the, in the corridor at the same time. We also have similarly a facial match scenario so we have people in there who have the same facial features but are dressed differently because we want to see again what cues are the CVI kids picking on in order to picking up on in order to identify the target and we also have a situation where we look at no clutter where we remove or simplify the visual environment we take out the posters the the lockers and so on to see again does visual the, the complexity of the visual environment affect performance as well and here's what uh, the group data actually looks like so just showing you again similarly a head-to-head -head comparison the left is a, a, a an individual age mash and neurotypical control right is an individual with CVI and the task here is to find uh, the 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 principal of the school, and you can see in the case of low distractor levels, the control and CVI individuals are able to find the individual and track them very, very easily. Here's the catch trial. Do you see how the CVI individuals has to look back and forth to make sure that they're looking at the right person while the control is able to track them very, very easily. Here's the high distractor setting with a large, large crowd. You can see the, C the control individual tracks them very, very easily where the CVI individual has a delay in order to find the person and track them until they leave the screen. Looking at the heat map projections, uh, similar to what I showed you in terms of the, the toy box, here's a control individual at the low and then the high distractor level. We see this sort of a pear or flame-shaped uh, dispersion uh, surrounding uh, the, uh, the face and torso area. In other words, this is what the individual is using to identify uh, the target. And we can see that that dispersion is, is quite similar in the low as well as high distractor levels. In the case of the CVI individual, we see that dispersion is localized largely, again, over the face and the um, and the torso area, but you notice how that search area is a little bit larger, and that area is considerably larger here, you can see on the high distractor task, again, indicating that the task is much, much harder for them on the high distractor level. Again, plotting the data similarly to what I, I showed you for the toy box, here we're plotting gaze error as a function of distractor density. Again, our controls show a largely flat relationship over task demand. Similarly, as we saw with the toy box, our CVI individuals, again, show this increasing uh, error or impairment of visual search with increasing task demand. And this is also true in our subpopulation of kids who have high visual acuity as well. Again, suggesting that this is a processing issue, not fundamentally an issue of impaired visual acuity. We are now also experimenting using this approach, uh, perhaps as a, as a, as a tool um, in the classroom that could be useful to develop cues that might be uh, useful for the individual. What we did here is that working with one particular individual, again, showing you the data, this is gaze error, uh, um, uh, plotted as a function of, uh, of task difficulty. Our controls are in blue here. Again, flat relationship here. And here's our one individual showing you that as the task gets, uh, the task gets harder, his impairment uh, is, uh, is more and more evident. What we decided to do is to say, what would happen if we put the target in a very, very high salient um, condition? In other words, imagine the principal was wearing a bright yellow jacket, for example. And when we reran the task on this individual, what we found is we essentially normalized his performance. In other words, he was performing just as well as neurotypical controls when we added this simple cue of, high, of, of adding high salience to the target. Just showing you the video of how this worked out. On the left, this is the individual 
uh, using the, the high salience target cue on the right without. And what you'll find here is you'll see that when the yellow jacket is present, he's able to find it very, very easily in track. And without, he misses it completely. Um, so just an example of a very, very simple scenario where changing a simple cue may actually have a benefit for increasing and improving performance. I'm not suggesting that principal should all wear yellow jackets, but it then just shows you how a simple manipulation using virtual reality to figure out what cues are most beneficial for a particular individual could be useful and transferable into the real world setting. I'll finish just uh, a very, very quick story with this. We're very, very close to the families uh, that you work with, as you might imagine. And I remember showing this data to the mother of the child um, uh, who was participating in the study, and she was quite struck at the effect of just how the saliency color uh, was able to, to help him uh, improve his performance. And she told me a story about how they were going to an amusement park, uh, and the child was obviously quite concerned, and the family was quite concerned because the child would get lost and quite anxious, and there's a very, very busy crowd, and he wouldn't be able to find uh, his family. So the mother had this very, very clever idea of making sure everybody would wear bright orange t-shirts. Uh, so that way, so here's, here's the young man in question. This is his family. So every time he would turn around, he could find his family very, very easily. This, of course, made, made him feel very, very good and, and, and less anxious about the situation. He was able to enjoy his day just simply from a very, very simple modification that, again, we could probe using this virtual reality simulation. So just to wrap up some, some conclusions and some thoughts here, opportunities and gaps as we move forward, I really want to highlight the importance of assessing visual function, which we typically do in the clinical setting, versus functional vision, which is really how an individual uses their vision in the real world. And as we work with individuals with visual impairments, it's extremely important to assess that functional vision aspect. It's also important to distinguish between ocular versus brain-based visual impairment because we know that strategies and assessments for one population don't necessarily transfer to the other, and we have to find new ways as brain-based visual impairment becomes more and more uh, common, uh, better ways to assess these individuals. And we've talked about, of course, virtual reality as a novel approach to characterize functional vision assessments with high ecological validity. Um, this could potentially facilitate diagnosis, particularly in those individuals with, again, no ocular issues and we're trying to understand exactly what are their visual impairments. It may help identify trigger features and environmental modifications, as I mentioned, simplifying the environment, using color as various cues to, to help the individual improve their performance in real world scenarios. It's also a platform for neurophysiological studies to investigate neural correlates. So we couple uh, this technology with other measures, for example, fMRI and EEG, to help investigate and uh, characterize how the brain is processing this information using our virtual reality uh, stimu uh, stimuli as tasks. Uh, you can also think about simulation-based learning and training and strategy development and skill transfer, as I said, using virtual reality as a way to probe and assess these, uh, these particular modifications and then transferring them into real-world settings once you know or have hints that they may actually work. And then the last thing I'll mention, particularly today uh, in, uh, in our situation of the current pandemic, this may also be a good way to assess and train individuals remotely. We can bundle these virtual reality tasks, send them through the Internet, have individuals work on these tasks at home, monitor their progress, and work with them to see if these are things that, uh, that may actually benefit them. So finally, I just want to say thank you to a number of individuals who are participating in this study. At the Laboratory for Visual Neuroplasticity, I have the pleasure of working with some great individuals and collaborators. I also want to highlight our collaborative work with the Perkins School for the Blind, as well as Boston Children's Hospital, and also identify our funding support from the National Eye Institute and various private foundations who have been extremely generous and supportive. And finally, also thank our participants and families that we've been able to develop really a wonderful relationship with. Um, they have really um, inspired us and given given us great ideas and, uh, and we hope to continue working with them. Thank you.